Today we are wrapping up a seven-part series called The Gospel According to Moses. We've taken a break from the expository preaching through the book of Acts. We will pick it up in two weeks. Next week we will look at community groups and um, talk a little bit about that as we launch into the fall season. And then the following week we're in um, Acts 18 and we'll walk through the rest of that book and then do a short series around Christmas called The Canticles of Christmas, uh, which is, means in Latin the poems or the songs in Luke 1 and 2. Um, so that's where we're headed. Um, so today, we're, though we're in, we're in numbers today, although we've been looking through the life of Moses through the book of Exodus, and we've said the Exodus, the theme of Exodus as a whole is the redeeming work of God, the redeeming work of God for His glory and our good. The book of Numbers is the continuing story of, of that redemptive work of God. The, the book of Exodus opens up with the Israelites in bondage, enslaved in Egypt, God goes to Moses, commands him to to go to Pharaoh, the king, and to tell the king that he he, he must let the people go, the Israelites go, so that they may worship him. Remember, he didn't say, let my people go so they can just be a nation by themselves, or let them go so they can have a barbecue while they're wandering around. He said, let my people go so that they may worship me. We've been studying and saying as we walk through the book of Exodus that the book of Exodus teaches about slavery and sin. Teaches about, gives us definitions about salvation and redemption and deliverance. Slavery, according to scripture, is is worshiping, is, is serving, is loving, is treasuring anything more important, more central than God. And last week, we saw the book of Exodus close. It opened in bondage and slavery and ends, chapter 40, in worship. Remember, last week, we saw the Shekinah glory come down and, and fill the tabernacle. It was the first time that the actual nation as a whole, as a people, as a nation, saw the, the, the glory cloud, saw the, the presence, was in the, the panim, the face of God as he came down. Moses had seen it, the elders have seen it, but now God comes and encamps and dwells and, and his Shekinah glory enters the portable tabernacle. And until we come, because the principle is, until we come to worship, until we come to the place of loving and treasuring and serving God and God alone, then we can be free. Book of Exodus opens up the narrative. And actually, the whole book of Neg- uh, Exodus is, is about a year long uh, of their um, of their you know, freedom from Egypt into uh, Sinai. And it's about a year. The whole book was about a year in a narrative form, in, in historical form, of, the, of, of what happened with the 40-year wandering. And that's in, that's in um, um, Exodus. Numbers, though, when Numbers picks up, that's the other 39 years approximately. Okay, it's approximate. So Exodus is the year journey. Numbers is the other 39 years. Exodus closes with the building of the tabernacle at Sinai. Numbers opens with further regulations, and, and it talks about uh, Israel's history from Sinai to, to Moab. It's broken into three parts. I just want to give you some historical background before we jump into chapter 21. The numbers, the book, the, the book of Numbers in chapter 1, verse through chapter 10, gives the events of Sinai right before leaving. They received the law, they got their regulations, they build a tabernacle for the first time. Right before they leave, they, 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 they number the people, they outline where the family should be around the, this portable tabernacle, there's duties of the priest. This all happens in the beginning of Numbers. And then when we get to chapter 10, they move on from Sinai to the plains of Moab, and they spend a lot of time in a place called Kadesh. And then the third section in the book of Numbers, chapters 20 through, through the end, It's all about Israel's activities while they were in the plain of Moab. So by the time we get to Numbers 21, is which way we will be, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, fourth book of Moses' five books. By the time we get to chapter 21 we're looking at today, I just want to give you a historical overview, is Moses' wife Miriam has died. They've been wandering close to 39 years. Aaron, you remember, Moses' brother and the priest, has also died. By the time we get to 21. In fact, in Numbers chapter 20, if you remember the story, Moses gets rebuked for striking the rock to get water from it rather than obeying God by commanding it to pour, to, you know, to pour out its water. And then God, if you remember the story, God tells him, you know what, because you didn't follow my commands the way I said it should go down, you're not entering the promised land. 
40 years of wandering, 40 years of, of, of building him up, and 40 years of wandering, and now Moses gets to the promised land, gets to see it, and then God takes him. You're like, ah, that's a bummer. <laughs> but I think what applies to Paul applied to Moses. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So let's not feel too bad for Moses. He died and went into the presence of his great good God and Savior. Amen? All right, so it's not too bad. Chapter 21 is interesting. Let me give you a real close historical look at this before we jump into this. Chapter 21 in Numbers is interesting because if you read the chapter, you will find that there are two major battles that take place in the beginning of the chapter and at the end of the chapter. Chapter In chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, there's a king, a Canaanite king called Arad, and he attacks Israel and actually takes them captive while they're out in the wilderness. The Israelites cry out to God, which they should, and say, you know, we need your help. If you help us, we're going to take them and we're going to go conquer them. And that's exactly what they do. And they go and, and, they, and they, 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 they destroy them. They, 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 they take over the Canaanites. They destroy the cities. And they actually named the city Her- Herma, mean destruction. Like, yes, Israel. Then you go down to verse 21 of chapter 21. Verse 21 of chapter 21. And there's a king, an Amorite king. And they say to the Amorite king, listen, we want to pass through. And the Amorite king's going, no. <laughs> there's a lot of people there. You are not walking through our city. We don't trust you. You know, whatever the reason may be, absolutely not. In fact, we'll gather an army and we're going to kill you. And they go after Israel. And what does God do? God provides. And they have faith in God. And God gives them victory. And it, it's a major victory, actually. In fact, that incident, uh, it is the um, verses 21 through 35, uh, Sion, the king, th- that incident is spoken about at least 12 times in the Old Testament being a great victory in battle. So in other words, I, I think what it's telling us is that you have this victory and then you have this major victory. It's kind of kind of a symbol, kind of a, kind of a, this is what's going to happen. If, you, if you're faithful to God, he will give you the victory. Look to him. He will help you conquer. And, and in the midst of this great victory of ch- verses 1 through 3 and 21 and following, there's defeat and disobedience. Well, in chapter 21. So they have this great God help us, yes, go. God help us, yes, go. Defeat, major defeat, big shot in the arm for Israel. And in between, there's defeat, disobedience. I say this all the time. Before we judge, let's relate. How many people here have seen God move mightily? How many people have taken great steps of faith only for the next day to fall flat on their face? I'm one. This narrative reminds us of the great victories, but it reminds us that God is faithful. Family, God is faithful. God is the hero of every narrative, of every story. God is not done with us. God is showing us that there is room to grow. There are always places in our lives where we need to learn to trust God as a loving dad teaches his children. That we're not always dependent on him as we think we are. Israel's failure reminds us of our need to trust God and that God is faithful. God is faithful. Look at our text. Chapter 21, verses simply 4 through 9. That's our text for today. We're going to see it under four headings. I have them there for you. I couldn't come up with an S word, so I used sniveling. I had sickness, solution, and savior. That was easy. They're kind of whining and complaining, but it doesn't start with an S. So we have the sniveling, the sickness, the solution, and the savior. Okay? Welcome to my world. That's where we're going. All right, the sniveling. Verse 4. Remember, victory, 1 through 3. Bottom, we got right in the middle. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea. They had one victory to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt in the wilderness? For there is no food 
to die, by the way, to die in the wilderness, for there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Right? Some sniveling, some complaining, and some half-truths, really. They're not starving to death. They're not dropping dead because of starving. In fact, God just broke the rock open, fed everybody, you know, gave every, some, everybody something to drink, and if you read the text, it actually fed their, their livestock. Their livestock got to drink. So the children of Israel are going through the wild uh, wilderness, and God has provided, but now they become impatient, and they begin to snivel. Now, it's only been, as I said earlier, 39 years. Say it again, 39 years. For some of you that like 26, 39 years, they've been wandering in circles in the hot wilderness. Now, why would they get impatient? So they openly expressed their heartfelt dissatisfaction to God and Moses about this monotonous, same old, same old diet of manna that they've been eating and the lack of water during this long journey through the desert. Now, reading this this week has hurt me. (laughs) So uh, this is going to be a downer for you a little bit, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, Misery loves company. I mean, if they are dissatisfied and impatient with God, in, in the way things are going after 39 years, that makes me the most pathetic human alive. <laughs> How many times, God, do it now? How impatient can I be at time when, when the timing just isn't exactly the way I want it to be? In a lot less than 39 years. Some will say, well, God had provided so much for them. They, they should have known better. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I, you know, I, I realized there was no restaurants in the desert. No drive up. No pass through. No, no way we could just get some burgers and go. But God sends every morning this special bread, this tasty bread... Actually, sweet resin, you could make flour out of it. It was like sweet like honey. You could make bread. You could make pastries. Every day, from the wilderness, out of the middle of nowhere, a direct, wonderful, right, daily testimony to the power of God, his commitment and his love toward them. And yeah, there were times they were extremely grateful, and there are times that we are. But now they detest it. I read somewhere this week that it was the eighth complaint. I didn't look up how many complaints uh, but, but I read somewhere that somebody else counted that eight times they had complained that God had provided. They had, they had just won the victory. God, they just called out to God. God responded, gives them victory, and they win, and they want to go around. They're like, wait a minute, let, let's stop here and just complain a little while. I mean, have you ever had God supply what you need, but, but you still got your hand out? Not what you want, but what you need. And doesn't that really and truly reveal the issue with our hearts, we're never satisfied. Here the Israelites, for a moment, take their eyes off the one who provided, took their eyes off the one who protected them every step of the way. And and let me throw this out there, too, while we're talking about sniveling and complaining. How powerful is it complaining all the time? Right? They're dissatisfied. How destructive is the satisfaction in God when we start looking for other things. When a person's heart is in- intent and, and rebellious and plagued by discontent, even the best things of the Lord can lose its savor. For nothing will never truly satisfy our hearts until it's made right with God. This satisfaction in our culture is, is a rampant thing, is it not? A few years ago, actually it was a while ago, uh, I looked this up. Um, 51% of the American people consider their lives, 51% of American people consider their lives as being dull and mundane. Think about that. Half of the people who live in the most prosperous country in the world are dissatisfied with their lives. In that same survey, 60%, it went up 9%, 60% of the people over the age of 50 regard their life without meaning. So it it indicates, or at least it's somewhat, if you look at statistics, that the older you get, the more dissatisfied you are with life. Maybe you're dissatisfied or discontented with your job or, or your marriage. Maybe you're discontent the way you look. 
I read an article uh, some years ago about women, and, and I knock men all the time here for you that I'm just saying this article I read, women were actually surgically cutting their toes down shorter so they could fit into pointed shoes for the way they look, right? Guys do all kinds of things too, so uh, I, I don't mean anything by that. But does everyone love their job? Is all marriage is always bliss all the time? Do you wish that you had a little more height, a little more hair, a little less belly? I mean, you know what I mean? Did your boss ever come to you and say, you know what, I'm going to give you a raise? You're like, nah, that's all right, I got enough money. Like, it doesn't really happen. So it's not necessarily wrong in themselves, but why is it then we're never satisfied with what we achieve, what we have? Well, I'm going to tell you, it goes back to Genesis in the garden. Adam and Eve, you have everything. Everything is yours. Adam, you have a beautiful, unclothed wife. Everything's yours. <laughs> Don't touch that. Right? He creates a universe. He gives them everything to enjoy. Don't eat that. Really? Where they eat of the fruit of the tree, it was forbidden. They weren't even satisfied with what God provided because sin, our disobedience, is really this trusting God. It's idolatry. The seeking of something other than the one true God to satisfy our desires. The final, the final satisfaction. Thomas Wilkie writes this. The foundation of all sin lies in man's desire of self-assertion and his determination to be independent of God, end quote. So Adam didn't want to stay as a child under the merciful, loving, fatherly protection of God. Being dissatisfied in his provision really is a character assassination on God. That's what it is. Being dissatisfied with what God has provided is a character assassination of the goodness of God. It's, it's disbelief in the love of God. Disbelief that God is good and God is always good to his children. That's what Satan used in the garden to tempt man. Did God really say that to you? Why would God keep something from you? He must not be good. Why would he keep something from you? Satan lied was for them to mistrust God, to refuse to believe that God was good, that God loves us, and he's, and he's looking out for us. He, he cares about us. That's the heart of the issue. And that is the cancer that makes us believe that we can stay in control of our life. We, should, cause we can't trust God. Now, 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 if, I'll, I'll hear this, okay? If we can see the brokenness of our hearts, the, the fickleness of our pursuit of satisfaction apart from God, if we can see the seriousness of idolatry, then we can get a glimpse at why God would go to such incredible measures to rid us of our idolatry, why he would go to great lengths to show us our sick hearts that seek satisfaction in things that will never ever satisfy us. Why there is this work of God to show us our sickness. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So into this camp... Some of your English translations have venomous snakes. The ESV picks up uh, the actual literal fiery serpents. There's a debate on exactly what kind of snake. I started looking at them thinking, they bite you, you die. It doesn't matter. You know, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> it could be black and red, red and yellow, whatever. I don't know what snake. I didn't spend a whole lot of time. They're dead. That, that's what I'm at. And they call it fiery snakes because they're not like they're on fire, but when they bite you, the 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 place in which they invite you is inflamed. And eventually what, what happens is you have this raging, burning fever. This ravenous thirst. All-consuming, unquenchable fire within. Burning. Wound, heart, everything in you burning and then death. And some of you may be thinking, I, I, maybe, I don't know. Really? So, I didn't want my burger that way? and you send snakes to bite me. We complained a little bit about the manna, and people are dying everywhere from snake bites. A little much. I want to be careful here. I want to say that God knows what he's doing. No one died before their time, right? 
But one of the obvious things that God is showing them and us is that when the venom of the serpent went into their bodies, it pointed to a greater reality. The unwillingness to trust God was a spiritual sickness that had settled in their hearts and in their souls. The all-consuming, unquenchable discontent and thirst began. Christian author Dorothy Sayers says this about sin. Sin, this is a definition. Sin is the radical interior dislocation of the heart. The radical interior dislocation of the heart. When a bone is out of joint, if you ever had one, I had my shoulder come out. It's not like only the shoulder hurts. It seems like every inch of your body hurts. You have a hip, you have a knee, something comes out of joint and you're walking all kinds of funny. You know, it doesn't matter where it is. It, it, it wreaks havoc on your body. Does it not? Well, what she's saying is the human heart, the human soul is like open arms seeking something, reaching out to someone or something to cling to. And the thing we run to, the thing we cling to, other than God, will never satisfy. It's a dislocation. Everything else is, is, is messed up. Here we see that our hearts are not centered on God. As a result, there is, there is an infinite, there is a, there is a discontent, a, a dissatisfaction in our life. So what's happening in their bodies is really exactly what is going on in their heart. The poison of the serpent in their bodies was a reflection, was a picture, was to show them the greater poison in their souls. It was utterly devastating. In other words, in all of us, since Adam's rebellion and dissatisfaction, there's a raging thirst. There's an unquenchable dissatisfaction in our souls. It's never satisfied until or unless a supernatural work of God and God becomes centered in our lives and we find our all-consuming satisfaction and centered on Him. And you know what's so hard to, what's so deceptive, I should say, is this toxic truth. C.S. Lewis, weight of glory. He said this, we, you and I, are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink, sex, ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because, because we cannot imagine what it meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We cannot Imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, end quote. That is the deception in our hearts. We think we're satisfied. It doesn't really last. The poison's there. That's why a lot of times this sickness, this, this unsettled, all-consuming fire uh, seems to move quicker and faster on those who have an abundance, the more you have many times, the more you feel, you know what? I, I, it's not enough. That's the poison. That's the hole. That's the vacuum. At first, it, it's great, and then you, then you loathe it. It reminds me of a story I read. Philip Parham, I don't know if you know him. He's a, a storyteller. Uh, he told of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman. An industrialist, very rich, very wealthy, saw this fisherman sitting lazily by his boat. This is what happened. He says to him, why aren't you out there fishing? Because I caught enough fish for the day, said the fisherman. Why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man said. What would I do with them, said the fisherman. You could earn more money, came the impatient reply. And buy a better boat so you can go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, catch even more fish and make more money. Soon you have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. And the fisherman turned to him and said, then what would I do? You could sit down and enjoy life, said the industrialist, rich industrialist. He says, what do you think I'm doing now, said the fisherman. <laughs> Solomon once said in Ecclesiastes, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remains with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward. This was a reward from all my toil. I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I expanded in doing it and beheld. All was vanity and the striving after wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. The book ends with what? Fear God, love the Lord, right? Two, two sad stories come to mind. Boris Becker, he's a tennis player. For those of you who play tennis, 
um, had everything, still was empty. And he said, I had won Wimbledon twice. Once I was the youngest player ever to do so. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. I guess it's like the old song about movies and pop stars who want to commit suicide. They have everything, and yet they're so unhappy. It's true. I had nothing on the inside. And, of course, the last one was Robin Williams. For just from an, from an external perspective, had everything. And I'm not taking anything away from, from mental illness and depression. It's very real. I'm simply saying there's nothing in this world that can satisfy. Nothing in this world. The poison, the sickness is in every heart. The famous philosopher mathematician Blake Pascal said it wonderfully. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there once was in a man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there. The help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. What would profit a man, right? Gain the whole world, Jesus said, and yet forfeit his soul. See, if we could see the brokenness, if we could see the emptiness, if we could see the pursuit of our idolatry, we could see the fickleness of our hearts and the seriousness of our idolatry, then we can get a glimpse why God would go to such great measures to teach this truth to Israel. We would go, we would see and know how our hearts are and that we would see how we run after things that will never satisfy, never eternally satisfy us. There's something in the center that's spiritually sick. There's a sickness, but there's a solution, verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord, against you. Pray that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses, pray for the people. Okay, so, and we'll look at the serpent in a moment, but let me just give you three things that led them to this place of solution. Okay, the pre-solution. Number one, the circumstances. You might go right by this without recognizing this. I just want to point it out. The reason Israelites saw the sickness of their soul is because of the physical ailment that came upon them. When the bodies were dropping, they knew something was wrong, right? I mean, if the poisonous snakes bite and the death of some folks, they would have not known what they were pursuing and their satisfaction could never be fulfilled apart from the real source of satisfaction, which is God. Sometimes I think, I'll speak for myself, but I, I think there are some here who would agree, if not all of you, that God sometimes sends trials and arduous circumstances to reveal the idols of our hearts, things that we chase after in the end will only really devastate us. It's really for our good and his glory. Unfortunately, if you're like me, you're looking to get out of the hard time. You're looking for immediate comfort without really pressing in and seeing what are you showing me? Is there a sickness in my heart? Is there pleasures that are taking the place of Christ? Is Jesus really the center of my life? Or is this thing, even if it's a good thing, has become an ultimate thing and now it's taking the place where Jesus belongs? We, we don't take that time and we don't see that so many times. In other words, they didn't see the poison in their hearts until they had the poison in their bodies. Dr. Tim Keller Virtually, he said, you never wake up to your need. You never really see what's wrong. You never are willing to admit the diagnosis until something goes wrong. Ain't that true? Almost all your wisdom, almost all spiritual growth, and all this stuff happens because something comes into your life that wakes you up and forces you to go to the great physician. So the criterion, the pre-solution is trials and troubles wakes us up. Number two, community. Community. What you see in this passage is Israel didn't just say I sinned against God, but I sinned against Moses. I didn't just complain against God, I complained against Moses. Moses, help us out. There's a community aspect to that. And I, what I want to say to you is, as, as they seek this solution, that life-changing encounters many times happens in community with brothers and sisters. Many of you know 30 of us went up to the Adirondacks. We spent time just... 30 men fellowshipping together and, and worshiping together. And one of the main goals that we hoped to achieve was community building. We talked about the importance of mentorship and discipleship. Standing together when trials and difficulties come for the glory of God. We talked about putting on the full armor of God so that as men we could stand side by side. Not only deflecting the enemy's attack but pressing on together. 
for the mission of Christ, to seek and save the lost. There's a communal aspect where, where sin and forgiveness must be addressed within the family of God. Right? Because community, I say this all the time, is messy. I get that. But we need to forgive one another. That is why we shape our community groups. That's why we believe the gospel shapes our community groups. Our community groups do not shape the gospel. Number three, if circumstances come in and change, they repented. They took, they, they, they didn't say, this is what repentance is not. Lord, you should have never done this. This is an overkill. They didn't do that. Lord, you, you know what? There's some other way you could. They, they said, whatever it takes. We have sinned against God. We have sinned against you. Whatever it takes is justified. That's true repentance. The brokenness of my soul, the brokenness of my heart, that's re- it's, I've sinned against God. And whatever it took for you, Lord, to send that so I can see my heart, thank you. Because there is joy in repentance. Don't let anybody tell you there is. There is joy in repentance. Jesus teaches us to repent. Paul teaches us to repent. There is joy in repentance. Genuine repentance comes when you begin to understand the seriousness of your sin, how it destroys your nature, and how it dishonors God. You know, God in his love shows us, and it may hurt, but God in his love shows us that the thing we're chasing, that the sin we're after, that the pleasure we're seeking in outside of him is going to destroy us in the end. We may not like it when God points that out but he's doing it because he loves us. Luke 15, you remember this story? The prodigal's, actually the two sons, but the prodigal wakes up, comes to his senses. I'm going to go to my dad. I sinned against God. I sinned against you. He didn't make no excuses. He took personal responsibility. It involves the emotion, the, the volition, and the mind. The Israelites responded with repentant hearts. Though driven in part by a desperate circumstances, I mean, they're praying for healing. I, I, they should. But the circumstance drove them to genuine repentance. Now let's look. Look at the solution. Verse 7. So Moses prayed for the people. and The Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. Verse 9. Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and he would live. Some of you involved in medicine, right? The trucks, the plaques, the uniforms, the building has to do with medicine. What do you see? They, they call it, I, I want to get this right, Ku caduceus, is that right? Caduceus? It's a symbol of healing. You see the, the snake wrapped around the pole. I just was coming back from the Adirondacks yesterday. I passed an ambulance, and I've been happy to thinking about this, and there it was on the hospital. It's, it's a sign of healing. In fact, it's one of the oldest signs for healing is that snake around the pole. Sometimes it's two snakes, sometimes it's one snake around the pole. It's a sign for healing. That's where they get it from, the story. If you didn't know that, you learned something new today. So aren't you glad you came? Now, if we're honest, it is kind of weird. Think about it. It's a, it's a strange passage of Scripture. God tells Moses, listen, all the snakes that are killing your mother, your father, your children, because people have died, these snakes that are destroying you, take one, a symbol, and have everybody look at the thing that's killing you. And you'll be healed. Some people say, no, Moses was picking up some ancient, you know, Egyptian worship. They've been excavated and they found that the Egyptians would worship, you know, symbols of snakes. Well, first of all, they worship not to get bit, <laughs> right? Please don't bite me. Don't kill me. Don't, you know, that, no, God says after you've been bit, while you're, si- while you're sick, look to me. Look to me, right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the serpent per se that healed them. The person was in mortal danger if they, if they neglected to look to God with faith as they looked upon the serpent. That, that's what it really was about. They stood between life and death in their decision. And the image was not the end of itself. It was the one whose power was behind it. It wasn't some magic ritual, some, some pagan ritual. The solution, the healing, would require faith and obedience on the part of the people who were bitten as Moses lifted up the pole from a distance. Someone who was bitten had to, had to look at this elevated pole, trusting the God behind it to heal them of their sickness. So the weak, the lame, the, the paraplegic, the old, the young, the baby, whoever, all they had to look 
All they had to do was look. And they were healed. Look and say, hope is back in our nation. Hope is back in our community. What God was saying was, I'm the one who heals you. I'm the one who, who, who stops the snakes. I'm the one who has the power. I am the one who put the snake up on the pole. I am the one. Look to the snake. Look to me. Look to my power and you'll be healed. And that's what they did. But let's be honest. There had to be some people in the wilderness going, really, I look at that and, and it's upsetting to me. My son is dead. I look to that, it, it killed my mom. It's upsetting. It had to challenge them tremendously to take a step of faith to look at the thing that had hurt so many people. And let me tell you something else it challenged. It challenged the Israelites in their understanding of God. Why? Because Satan, serpent, represented sin from Genesis 3. The serpent was evil. The serpent was sinful. The serpent, according to Leviticus, was unclean. It represented sin and evil. And although they had very limited understanding, they, by faith, and obeyed the word of God through Moses, and they lived. It wasn't until centuries later when a Bible-thumping religious leader named Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ at night. He said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. Jesus then responds. He just cuts right to the chase. And he says to this Bible-thumping religious leader, truly, truly, verse 3 of John chapter 3, John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, listen, all your religiosity all your Bible sword drills. You can't get into heaven. No matter how much of the law you know, no matter how much of the law you obey, even a Bible teacher, it has to be done through the supernatural birth work of God. You need to be born again. In other words, you're no different, Nicodemus, than the prostitute, the whore, the drug addict, and the Bible thumper. You all come through the way of the cross. Nothing you have done is of any benefit. Nothing will help you to achieve coming into my kingdom, my rule, my presence, my paradise. Nothing. Bible scholar, prostitute, religious leader, pagan. You're saved radically by new birth, by grace and grace alone. Just like your natural birth, you had nothing to do with. If you think you did, ask your mom. She's going to tell you you did nothing to help give, you, give birth to you. You were along for the ride, and it hurt. You made it worse. Okay? You didn't say, oh, you know what? Just relax, Mom. I'll do this. You didn't do that. You, you gave nothing to it. You did nothing. So you don't choose to be born naturally. You don't choose to be born spiritually. It's a work of God that God alone does. And Nicodemus, in tongue-in-cheek, says to him, really? <laughs> How can I be born in my mother's womb? Again, how does that happen? Verse 5, truly I say to you, unless one is born of the word and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Natural birth, spiritual birth. And then Jesus says in verse 10, chapter 3, John 3.10, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Verse 11, truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know, we bear witness to what we see. But you don't receive our testimony. If I, Jesus, have told you earthly things that you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you Heavenly things. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. I've come from God. I was with God. I was in his presence. I am the son of man. Verse 14, and Moses, and he says, so no one goes, I have come from God. I'm talking to you about new birth. And then verse 14 says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh, I, Nicodemus had to go, wait a minute. Ah, oh, wait. I know that story. People perished in the wilderness. They died by the snake bite. Moses was the one who lifted up the serpent and brought healing to the people. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Do you see what he's telling Nicodemus? What happened in the wilderness has its ultimate and final understanding and interpretation at the cross. Both the horror, the glory, the crucifixion, and the exaltation. The snake is symbolic of sin because it was a serpent that tempted Adam and Eve in the garden and brought sin into the world. 
It brought the unquenchable thirst. It brought dissatisfaction. That's what all their sin brought. And what Jesus is saying is, when I am lifted up, when I am crucified, when I cry out from the cross, I thirst. When I cry out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because, it's because I took your thirst. It's because I took your satis dissatisfaction. It's because I took your mistrust, your sickness on myself and experienced hell, the wrath and the, and the separation from the Father that you deserve, I took when I was lifted up. 2 Corinthians 2 says this, For our sake, He, God the Father, made Him, Jesus, God the Son, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You know what that means? It means simply this, that on the cross, Jesus Christ, our good God and Savior, got treated as a serpent should be treated, treated as sin should be treated. Listen, Listen carefully. When Christ was lifted up, it's a euphemism for death. He was lifted up onto death to bear our sin, to take our penalty, to pay the price, to be a curse for you and for me. Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us as it is written. Cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Jesus says, I will die, I will be smitten, I will be bruised, I will be lifted up, and I will drink the poison so that you don't have to. He became sin means that Jesus got what sin deserves. Sin, death, hell, and wrath. Jesus Christ is the greater and better Moses. Jesus Christ is the greater and better Moses who did not intercede by lifting up a pole, but interceded by being lifted up on a pole. Now watch this. Let me wrap this up. Jesus is speaking about death, dying for sin, resurrection, only means of forgiveness. But what's he say? Tie this all together with Nicodemus. What he's saying to Nicodemus, you can't earn your healing. You can't earn, earn your forgiveness from sin, from death and from hell. You got the medicine. You get this medicine when you stop trying to do it on your own. Don't go home and get some rest. Don't go home and take some fluids. Don't go home and follow... Look and live. Look and live. The average person will say, what do I got to do to meet God? What do I got to do to be right with God? What do I have to do? Do I got to start going to church? Do I got to start reading my Bible? Do I got to sleep, stop sleeping with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? All good things. But Jesus would say, stop trying to save yourself and start, start looking to me. Dr. Keller tells a great story about Charles Spurgeon, great 19th century preacher, his conversion. This is what he says. He was a young man looking to find God, but he didn't understand things. He was sort of on a spiritual search mode. He didn't really understand, and he started visiting churches. And in January of 1850, he was trying to get to church. Charles Spurgeon was trying to get to church, 1850. He was walking, and there was a huge, enormous snowstorm, so much so that he couldn't make it, so he turned down a side alley and walked into this little primitive Methodist chapel. He gets there, there's 12 people, the pastor's not there, and someone turns to a guy, he thinks he was a shoemaker, and said, why don't you preach? No preparation, the guy stands up, opens his Bible to Isaiah 45, 22, and he reads this. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And he looks out over the 12 people, and he says, my dear friends, this is a simple text. It says to be saved, you only need to look. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger, it's just look. You didn't need to go to college to look. Even a child can look. You needn't, you needn't be worth a thousand pounds a year to look. Anyone can look. Ah, he says, but the text says, look unto me. Aye, now, he says, many of you are looking to yourself. It's no use looking there. The text says, look unto me. And Charles Spurgeon says, then the good man lifted his arms to the heavens and began to cry. The Lord says, look unto me, I am sweating drops of blood from my brow. Look unto me, I'm hanging on the cross. Look unto me, I am dead and I am buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend to heaven. Look unto me, I am sitting at the right hand of the Father. Look unto me. Spurgeon says, after a good time, about 10 minutes, the guy noticed me sitting in the back. I was a stranger. He fixed his eyes on me and he said, young man, you look miserable. You will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death until you obey my text, young man. Look, look to Jesus. You have nothing to do but to look and to live. End quote. 
The bread in the cup is looking to Jesus. If you're trying to save yourself, if you're seeking and pursuing things that never satisfied, look to Jesus. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You have to simply look and live. Look and believe and trust. Are you trusting Christ? Are you trusting Christ for your salvation? Are you trusting and savoring and treasuring Christ above all the things in your life? What has got your heart, enamored your heart? Even if it's a good thing, it becomes an ultimate thing. It becomes an idle thing. The bread represents his body that was given for you. The blood, the cup, the blood that was shed. We do this because we remember, and Christ invites us, if you're a Christian, to the table. If you're not a Christian, then, then repent of your sins. That means turn from them and trust in Jesus and come and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Look unto Jesus, who went on the cross, was hung up high, where he was crucified for our sins and in our place, taking the wrath, taking the insaluable thirst, unsatisfaction of your soul, so that you can have satisfaction in Him and Him alone. We'll spend time repenting. We'll spend time confessing quietly in your seat. And then when you're ready, come up and celebrate. Because it's about confessing, it's about repenting, but it's about celebrating. He died for all our sins, past, present, and future. Let's pray. Father, just as Jesus declared... That the Son of Man must be lifted up high. We trust in His sacrifice. As we look to Jesus, His death, His perfect life, His death, His burial, and His resurrection from the grave, we look to Jesus. Lord, show us ways of our hearts where we're seeking satisfaction in other things. We are trying to save ourselves. We're trying to be our own gods and saviors. Lord, we need to repent of those sins and look to you. Bring healing upon our souls. May we treasure you above all things. May we be released from our bondage and be set free to worship you in spirit and in truth through the work of your Son.